Good uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you to this um, uh, event of the Institute of International and European Affairs. It's part of the Global uh, Europe um, project, which is supported by the Department um, of Foreign Affairs. Um, the project aims to analyze and communicate to the wider public uh, the debate on the future of Europe, the EU's role in the world, and Ireland's role in the multilateral order. We're delighted uh, to be joined today by Margaritas Skinas, the European Commission Vice President for promoting our European way of life and I thank him uh, for taking time out of his busy schedule to speak to us on the topic of uh, EU migration and asylum policy. Um, Vice President Skinas will speak for about 25 minutes or so uh, and then we will go to Q&A with our audience. Um, now you'll be able to join uh, the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom which you should see on your screen and um, please feel free to send your questions in um, throughout the session as they occur to you uh, and we will come to them once the Vice President um, has finished his presentation. Uh, you can also join the discussion on Twitter uh, using the handle at IIEA. Um, we are live streaming uh, this afternoon's uh, discussion, so a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in uh, via YouTube as well. Um, now, a reminder uh, that today's presentation and Q&A uh, are both uh, on the record. Um, I'd like to now formally uh, introduce Vice President Skinas uh, and then to hand over to him. Um, uh, Margaritas uh, Skinas took uh, office as a European Commission Vice President uh, for promoting our European way of life in December 2019. Uh, in this capacity, um, he oversees the EU's policies uh, for migration, security union, social rights, uh, skills, education, culture, youth, health and dialogue with churches, religious associations and non-confessional um, organizations. Uh, Vice President uh, Skinas um, uh, is uh, no uh, novice uh, to the Commission. He's held a number of uh, uh, very senior positions in the Commission, including Chief Spokesperson under President uh, Juncker and Deputy Head of the Bureau of European Policy Advisors under President Barroso. And his experience is not confined to the Commission alone, uh, because um, um, Vice President Skinas uh, also served as a member of the European Parliament between 2007 to 2009. So without further ado, uh, I would like to hand over to Vice President Skinas now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Barrett. Uh, thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, be with you today, um, uh, although virtually, but still uh, uh, being able to discuss uh, migration. Um, uh, let me say from the very start that for already from my previous uh, professional lives, I'm a long standing supporter and admirer of the uh, Irish Institute for International and European Affairs. And, and not only because uh, my friend and former colleague, uh, Catherine Day, uh, always sang uh, your praises. Um, um, I also saw, uh, looking at your publications, uh, past records that uh, the Institute uh, has not yet produced a publication on EU migration policy and the new proposals we put on the table. So I, I hope that this is the beginning of a new <laughs> relationship. And that would be the, the, the first uh, stage, uh, the incentive, if you like, that uh, will uh, uh, make the, the bright minds in your midst to uh, put pen to paper on this uh, topic, because, because migration and asylum policy is really a crucial, a crucial one. Uh, is a topic that uh, uh, affects our society, our way of life, uh, it determines our policies, our politics. It's a cross cutting issue uh, that is uh, with us and uh, will stay uh, with us. We also have to recognize that the EU cooperation in the field of migration and asylum is relatively young. And let's face it, uh, has had a tough birth the EU didn't get competence uh, on asylum and migration until the Amsterdam Treaty in 1999. And the first generation of the uh, common European as asylum system was only introduced uh, back in the year 2000. So basically we are looking at 20 years of policy development. And these are issues, as I was saying, that traditionally are predominantly seen from a national perspective and considered to touch on core issues of sovereignty. And this is precisely why during these last 20 years, that perception uh, was difficult to change. Although uh, in a way, as it happened with the pandemic, 
that uh, shed light on the need for a European approach to health policy, a series of crises has also highlighted the need for a European and orderly uh, uh, approach to managing migration. Let's face it, uh, dear friends, the, the system in place, the system we have in place was not designed to deal with the realities we're facing today. It places the burden entirely on member states of first entry and has no inbuilt solidarity mechanism. Rather than a system, I would call the current situation on migration and asylum a non-system based on outdated concepts of a nation state managing its own small borders that doesn't match up to the need for a holistic, truly European approach. It didn't allow us to cope with a crisis, with the major crisis of 2015-16, which shaped politics in many of our member states when 10,000 people were arriving every day at one entry point in the union. At the time, since that time, we had to start looking outside the system to cope with the crisis. And a lot of what we have managed to do by looking outside our system has, was done in a fragmented and ad hoc way. Let me give you some examples. We tripled the number of live XA boats at sea and created a, a CSDP operation to fight smugglers. We started putting in place systems in countries of first entry to screen and register all new arrivals. We started working with third countries such as Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and the Western Balkans to address the situation there. We started raising funds to address the crisis in Syria and to address the root causes in Africa and our neighborhood. And we put a place ad hoc, fragmented, ad hoc, separate solidarity mechanism. We did try back in 2016 to modernize our common European asylum system with a commission proposal. But we now know that it's never easy to have architects and firefighters working on the same site. It has often been the case in the past that leaps and bounds in the European integration have taken place in the height of crisis. But that was not the case in 2016. We managed to cope with ad hoc situations, but we failed to provide a single cohesive, holistic framework for managing migration in Europe. It is therefore only with the benefit of a bit of hindsight and with the fact that we are now in a sort of grace period where irregular arrivals to Europe are at their lowest for years, that we can now have an opportunity to look for a much broader, more comprehensive approach to managing migration. As my former boss uh, uh, said, we have to fix the roof now that it has stopped raining. And this was my starting point when designing the new pact on migration and asylum, a set of reform proposals that we presented on last September and which I'm delighted to be able to discuss with you today. Our proposal starts by recognizing that no EU member states leaves migration in the same way, and that each have very different but equally legitimate concerns, all of which deserve to be taken into account in any European approach. Uh, a major mistake of the 2016 proposal, which was a proposal by from the heart, was that automatically created uh, red lines and very deep gaps between competing blocks of states. That's why with our new proposal, our starting point is to recognize that everyone's concerns have to be accommodated and taken into account. 
With this in mind, uh, I would like to, uh, I always do, to present uh, our proposal for a new EU pact for migration and asylum as a three store building, as a three story building, as, as a building with three floors. The first floor is the external dimension. We have to recognize that migration starts outside our borders. This was one of the stark lessons of 2015, that if we don't cooperate with countries of origin and transit, readmission, on issues like capacity building, on legal migration, we will never be able to manage migration internally. The new pact represents a change of paradigm in the way we engage with our international partners on migration, recognizing that this is a global phenomenon which calls for global solutions and responsibility sharing. Just on Monday, 15th of March, we had a historic meeting, a jumbo council of foreign and home affairs ministers together in one virtual room for the first time since 2015. And this was done not as was the case at the time in the aftermath of the Lampedusa tragedy, but this was done under normal circumstances with our pact proposal on the table, aiming at solidifying the need for this paradigm shift I was referring to earlier on the external dimension of migration. We know well that a one size fits all approach won't work in this area. And this is why we are putting the focus on comprehensive, balanced, win-win, mutually beneficial partnerships, tailor-made, to each partner country specific situation, interests and needs. We are determined to mobilize everything that the European Union has in our disposal to build the components of these partnerships, not only investment or money, but also visas, uh, trade preferences, Erasmus scholarships. We will do whatever it takes to help countries of origin and transit create the conditions for better lives for their citizens instead of putting their lives in the hands of the smugglers in the Mediterranean or in the Aegean. And at the same time, we would ask for their cooperation in managing more effectively their borders and engage more forcefully with us on returns and readmission. The second floor of the building is of course the emphasis on uh, a resilient system for managing the European Union's external borders. The external borders of the Union are a common responsibility and we need to ensure that they are managed effectively and that we support the member states at the external borders in doing so. Under the new pact, there will be a new and mandatory screening at all borders, allowing for directing people immediately to the right procedure with strong fundamental rights monitoring mechanism in place to ensure that this is done right. Alongside the new border procedures, we will create a seamless procedure at our external borders, which ensures people are quickly channeled to and through the right procedures. This is crucial because we have seen clearly in the past how inefficient procedures in the borders can cause hardship and dysfunction in the system, keep, keeping people in uncertain situations for long periods, such as the situation in Lesbos or Calais. And this will be complemented by a new European ecosystem geared towards effective returns. Those, Europe will continue to be an asylum destination for those who flee from uh, dictatorship and oppression. But those who have no legal reason to be under the European Union's legal protection will have to be returned. So this new system of external management borders, of management of our external border, would be a crucial element of responsibility in the overall policy mix of the future European migration policy. 
and this will be of course complemented by the uh, reinforcement and building up of our new European uh, Coast Guard and uh, Border Guard Agency, Frontex, which will have a standing corp of 10,000 uh, staff by 2027 and an increased budget of 6 billion for the next seven years. Finally, the third floor of the building of the proposal uh, would pertain to strong and fair solidarity and burden sharing arrangements. A credible European migration system must be able to provide for permanent effective solidarity for all those who are by geography are the most confronted with migratory challenges. So this third floor is a key element of the overall architecture of the overall construction. And this solidarity, of course, also has to be one of, uh, that it builds on the lessons learned and respects respective uh, uh, red lines. Solidarity will be the rule in the future European migration policy. But we feel that it is possible to combine the principles of flexibility with guaranteeing that effective solidarity is available when needed. So what member states can do is choose how they would contribute into the solidarity uh, effort, not if they contribute. In other words, there will be no exit door from the solidarity floor. Dear friends, all these new proposals we're presenting under our pact must be seen as a connected whole, as a connected circuit, not as the current uh, patchwork of uh, regulatory uh, fragmentation that we were discussing earlier. Our new proposal is for a system where there is one circuit and everything connects to everything else screening, border procedure, asylum procedure, returns, solidarity, everything must connect seamlessly. And the new system should also look at migration from A to Z, which also means having credible legal migration and integration policies that will benefit European societies and economies now and in the long run. It is designed as a much more effective and comprehensive governance system that ensures that solidarity is effective in practice and that the challenges of migration are addressed comprehensively, be it outside or inside our union. We are also continuing to roll out further elements of the pact. In April, we'll come forward with a voluntary return and reintegration strategy and we will also soon put forward proposals on the future of Schengen. Since we put the proposals for this new system on the table uh, last September, 23rd of September, the pandemic, of course, has of course limited somewhat the ability to advance the discussions and the negotiations with the full ambition that I would have liked. But nevertheless, I believe that the discussions that have taken place so far and recently in the Jumbo Foreign Affairs and Home Affairs Minister last Monday do present a path forward of convergence. I think on these issues, despite their sensitivity as issues where there is a wide recognition emerging that member states can no longer go it alone. In the area of migration and asylum policy, as much as in health policy, now is the time for Europe to come together around practical and fair solutions. And I'm also convinced that this is an area where we need Europe the most. It remains the fact that the biggest pull factor for irregular migration to Europe today is precisely the lack of a proper and common European migration management system. This is what makes smugglers 
richer and richer. The fact that they somehow think that the lack of a system, of a comprehensive system, allows for uh, uh, the gaps and the cracks to be advanced, exploited, and, and, and this creates a permanent pull factor that we need to address. Now is the time, and I'll finish with that, to move away from these ad hoc fragmented solutions and put in place a common European framework to what is a common European challenge. I will stop here and look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Vice President Skinas. That was a, a fascinating introduction uh, to a topic which is of uh, um, uh, huge uh, importance and, uh, and, and relevance. So I'd like to invite um, uh, our, um, uh, those, those in the audience now, and um, we've, we've a, a big audience of about 100 uh, participants here today. Um, uh, the, the attendance at uh, many of the Institute events has, has really um, uh, been facilitated, I think, by the ability to watch them online. So we're delighted to have so many participants. So now is the opportunity, if you like, to, to, to pose uh, questions uh, relating, uh, to, uh, uh, relating to the topic addressed. Um, I might uh, abuse, if I may, my position as, uh, as host by perhaps uh, uh, getting the ball rolling um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in this regard. Um, uh, first, maybe one question. Um, uh, the, the, the European Union is the, large, the world's uh, largest provider of development assistance, and, and the pact, of course, reasserts the Union's values and support for human rights. But is there nonetheless a reputational risk for the EU um, associated with the pact's strong emphasis on effective returns and readmissions mechanisms and on, on legal pathways? Um, that would be one question. Um, secondly, if I could put, um, uh, without um, uh, overburdening you with, with questions, but, but uh, if I could put a second um, uh, question in relation to two countries, um, what significance would you attach to the UK's changed status as a third country on this issue? Uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 I suppose EU-Turkey relations would be another one there. They continue to be fraught in a number of areas, and yet the, 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 the European Union and Turkey are condemned to interdependency, um, if you like, uh, particularly on, the, on the, the issue of migration and asylum. So in this context, what scope uh, would you see for con continued constructive engagement uh, between uh, um, uh, the European Union and Turkey within this new vision for EU migration policy. So I can't, I can't be accused of giving you two easy questions uh, to, to begin with, uh, but, uh, but there you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Professor Barrett. Let me start with the uh, returns and readmission and the, the re reputational risks or not. Um, I think that uh, the center of gravity uh, of the uh, pact uh, is an effort uh, that we intentionally make to find the right mix between solidarity and responsibility. Because one of the lessons we learned from our 2016 failure is that we came forward with uh, the solidarity element with the third floor without being able to prove that the responsibility elements were in place, the first and the second floor, third countries and borders. So obviously um, those member states who were um, rather reluctant um, use this as an excuse to create the, the the problem, the, the, the gridlock in which we found ourselves six years ago. So now we are creating a, a landing zone <laughs> or this notion of, of uh, three floors where we think that the, the, the right balance between responsibility and solidarity is, is very clear. On the responsibility side, we have this change of paradigm with third countries where we will invest uh, in these partnerships, which are not only good for us, it will be also good for them. So it would not be about us imposing anything to our neighbors and countries of origin and transit, but is also offering them the incentives to engage with us on a meaningful way of managing migration. And of course, returns and readmissions are part of this. They should not be demonized or should not be uh, victimized. This is a part of the responsibility element, which is in, in turn is part of the responsibility solidarity equilibrium that we're looking for. Now on the two uh, um, 
countries, uh, third countries now that you, you mentioned. Of course, there is, there is a difference uh, because uh, the, uh, the UK, the United Kingdom is, is a country of uh, destination, of reception, whereas Turkey is a country of transit uh, and sometimes also origin of migratory flow. So um, th there is a difference on, 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 on between the two. Um, uh, the UK uh, did not want to have a, a migration chapter in the in the in the future relationship per se. We have uh, uh, agreed to continue talking on how we can enhance uh, uh, cooperation in the in the issues of justice and home affairs uh, to do more. Uh, but clearly, the focus of the future relationship is is uh, on on trade uh, and and i think the time did not allow for 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 more on turkey on the contrary we have uh, the 2016 agreement or rather eu turkey statement which worked which worked well it it's it's a it's a contract of mutual uh, trust if you like where uh, both parts uh, engage uh, in a number of uh, deliverables. Um, Turkey is the country that hosts the biggest number of refugees in the planet. They have around 4 million Syrians uh, that uh, they, they live there. And uh, our efforts were, of course, to provide for support uh, uh, to the uh, uh, receiving communities, host communities, international organizations, NGOs to, to help uh, accommodate Turkey and alleviate the burden that Turkey uh, uh, had to assume for these people. Uh, now, this March uh, on the 25th of the European Council of 25th of March, it is the uh, five year anniversary of the, of the uh, uh, 2016 statement we feel that there is scope uh, to refresh uh, this uh, arrangement, not to conclude a new contract, but to review the contract and see how we can uh, usefully um, expand our cooperation, not only in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of uh, qualitative improvements. Uh, for example, consider if certain parts of the Turkish uh, state apparatus that deliver services to the refugees, like the health service or the education ministries, can become directly recipients of, of support. We can also see if there are other populations other than Syrians that are there that need support. So there is a, a spirit of openness and cooperation. This is also a win-win. Uh, the European Council of last December specifically asked the Commission to consider uh, this move, and I think we still have uh, what eight, ten days uh, before the summit, and uh, uh, we are still in time to do it. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much indeed for those very useful uh, replies. We've got quite a number of um, uh, questions uh, uh, coming in uh, at this stage. I'm delighted to say uh, one of them uh, is from uh, former Irish ambassador um, to the United Kingdom, Bobby McDonough, um, um, uh, and uh, he notes that uh, you are commissioner for promoting the European way of life. Do the different attitudes to inward migration in Europe, for example, in Hungary, suggest that there is no agreement on what that European way of life should be? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, many of the participants uh, would have followed uh, in December 2019 when uh, my vice presidency was announced for the first time by President van der Leyen. They followed a very, uh, how should I call this, uh, um, schizophrenic uh, and often self-flagellating debate uh, on, on what the European way of life actually means, uh, which says a lot about Europe that we have to like um, dispute uh, or, or, or interpret differently uh, what the European way of life means, uh, 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 taking into account that the rest of the world considers the European way of life as, 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 as a model uh, for most parts of the planet. But still, be it as it may, I think I had the chance to explain in my hearing in the European Parliament that I never saw uh, this uh, job as uh, something that entails binary choices. It's not us or someone else. It's not us against the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, European way of life, it's not a bulldozer 
that would sort of crush everyone or impose our, our model to anybody else. I always thought uh, that the European way of life, and that's the spirit with which I'm working, is more like a mirror that reflects the diversity of what the European Union represents today. Uh, the richness of our traditions, of our politics, of our culture, of our arts, of our languages, of our education system. And, and this is what makes us unique. This is what makes us uh, being so diverse, but at the same time, being able to be together, democracies, protecting minorities, defending the, the role of women in society, in the workplace, um, being the world champions of human rights, uh, having uh, universal systems for health care and education, uh, taking care of our elderly, uh, no death penalty. You, you can find bits and pieces of this elsewhere, but all this together, basically, you can only find in Europe. <laughs> so for me, uh, this was never uh, something that should be used to polarize politics or face one another. This is what Europe is, 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 is united through diversity. And I very much also like to recall uh, President Macron's uh, famous uh, speech uh, at the Sorbonne, uh, who described the European way of life as the aggregate of a Europe that protects and the Europe that empowers. I think this is very much my job, uh, a Europe that protects with policies like migration, security, public health, and the Europe that empowers, which is a Europe of mobility, European culture, education, skills, youth. Uh, so um, yes, of course, in certain parts of our geography, uh, there are political traditions that often project uh, uh, different messages. But I think that this overall diversity or overall unity in diversity is much stronger than, than we think and keeps us together. Great, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, a, a question from uh, Aoife McMahon now, um, are there plans to bro broaden the scope of legal migration into the EU? For example, e uh, visas for long-term low-skilled work, it seems that there would be less unlawful migration, she argues, if there were more legal routes. Um, also, it seems that EU member states need low-skilled workers. Um, uh, and she adds in, thank you very much. Your presentation was very informative. So a little, uh, little compliment there as well. <laughs> thank you. I, th I think uh, she's absolutely right. Uh, indeed, uh, and I think I, I, I said it uh, probably not, not uh, extensively, that there will be no uh, overall uh, success in migration and asylum policy unless we have a very strong um, uh, integration uh, and education component and at the same time uh, a legal migration component. Um, the reasons are obvious, uh, not only demographics, uh, Europe still faces a huge demographic challenge, but also we are facing um, a skills gap. Uh, Europe needs a skills revolution in, in the years to come. And in both of these areas, demographics and, and skills, uh, legal migration can play an important role. Tactically, and uh, I'm... We are on the record now, but I have no problem to, to say that we thought that uh, introducing the legal migration uh, dimension into the proposals for the EU pact would make it, would put together two very important subjects together. And, and um, practically in, in European policymaking, it's always easy to sequence <laughs> important proposals. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do that uh, uh, Sequentially, it will come. Uh, we have proposals on legal migration that will be coming uh, later this year. Well, thank you very much. And a, a kind of question, if I may follow that with a, a, a further question from uh, Nora Owen, uh, who's the former Irish Minister for Justice, uh, who's also in the audience. Um, uh, uh, she, uh, uh, this is a question more or less on, on the borderline between the last two. Uh, many people who are awaiting answers to their application for permission to remain in Ireland um, have worked very hard providing service during the pandemic. Um, has there been any discussion on granting asylum or permission to stay, or would a type of amnesty for this particular cadre cause a problem for the system? 
Well, this is also a very interesting question, but uh, as you probably know, under the existing system, all uh, asylum uh, decisions are national decisions. It's, it's the national asylum systems that uh, uh, govern this, this type of decisions. Uh, in, in our pact, we, we are aspiring to have a European uh, way of managing migration, very, with, always with a very strong national uh, asylum uh, service component. But in, under the new proposals, we also provide for a reinforced role for uh, EASO, the European Asylum uh, Agency, which will be uh, helping national authorities. So um, I, I think this is a totally legitimate uh, request uh, to consider, but uh, it does not depend uh, from Brussels. This is something that would have to be discussed and, and decided upon at, at national level. Very good, very good. Um, we have a question from uh, Connor uh, Ryan. He, first of all, uh, thanks you for your comments and says he, that he has fond memories from hearing you speak a number of times at the College of Europe in Bruges, so, so that's good to hear. Um, uh, now, Connor um, wonders if you could convey, uh, uh, if we could convey the following question to you. Um, is there really true solidarity among member states if countries like Hungary, for example, contribute to the new migration pact merely by organising or facilitating returns, um, or could uh, contribute by doing that? Um, and uh, he notes that he remembers a director of Human Rights Watch describing this element of the policy as like asking the school bully to walk a kid home. Um, so um, he wants to know if you have any any thoughts in relation to that yeah um i think one has to compare uh, what happened back in 2016 with what we're trying to do now <clears throat> back to 2016 let's face it we failed we failed for the reasons i discussed the, the overall balance responsibility solidarity was not there <laughs> also we were in the middle of the crisis so it's always difficult to have uh, firefighting and, and, and architects, uh, to firefighters and architects together, as I said. And there was also another difficulty for those of you who remember that a few months ago, we had decided by qualified majority uh, in the council, a system of relocating uh, people uh, to uh, within the European Union. And we did that against uh, the countries of Central Eastern Europe. And, and this created wounds that were very recent, they were not healed uh, when we came up with the proposal. So uh, the starting point to answer Connor's question is that now we took time effort and we consulted at Nozean precisely to make sure that this landing zone that we, are, we have presented, it's, 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 it's a meeting point where everybody can meet that we do not want to reproduce the red lines of 2016, but we want to create the conditions for an agreement. And we have to offer alternatives to different uh, uh, geographical settings, but alternatives that contribute to the overall functioning of the system. Let me give you an example. The way the system is designed to work, in the moment that and then a member state at the point of entry pushes the solidarity button and requests a certain amount of solidarity and help from the union. It is a solidarity machine that is being activated by the commission. So we make sure that the member state that asks obtains a certain amount of support and help they need. We are confident that we can do that, that we can produce uh, matching the demand with, with the offer. If there is a part of solidarity that is still missing, we can still have a second round of collecting uh, contributions. And if at the end of the second round, there is still something missing, then ultima ratio, it is up to the Commission to issue an implementing act and impose the level of solidarity that's missing. That's, that's the overall system. That's what guarantees solidarity permanently. Now, at the same time, those who are to provide solidarity, including countries like uh, the one that Connor mentioned, should be given alternatives, but meaningful alternatives. And this idea of return sponsorship is not at all uh, 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 reminiscent of the bully who takes the, the boy back from school. No, on the contrary, it takes pressure off the system 
it is not relocation, but it's a meaningful contribution because it takes pressure out of the system. So a meaningful contribution to the solidarity basket. These return sponsorships will be done with the help of Frontex and with the financial instruments of the community budget. And at the same time, there is a clause that's not very well known, but there is a clause there that if a member state that assumes return sponsorships fails to implement them fully, this member state would be obliged to relocate those who have not been returned under the return sponsorship scheme. So as you would see from the new system, the new system is designed to create equilibrium at any moment, at any time. And key to that is what I was saying earlier, that there is no way out of the system. There is no exit door. You cannot pay your way out of the solidarity obligations. And again, this is the notion of the landing zone. And this is why I'm personally, I'm, I'm an optimist, I'm a born optimist, but I think that this time uh, it can work. Okay, well, hopefully that, uh, that optim optimism will, will prove justified. Um, Dara Maloney um, uh, has a, a question. Um, uh, is an increase in, in staffing numbers and in their budget, uh, uh, of Frontex's uh, budget and, and uh, in, the, in their numbers necessary, given that the number of migrants and asylum seekers entering the European Union reduced greatly in 2020? Yes, it is true that uh, uh, we are now discussing migration in normal circumstances without uh, the, the heat of the 2015-2016 uh, situation. It is also true that this is not the result of, uh, let's face it, let's admit it, this is not the result of our policy success. Uh, this is also related to the global halt that the planet uh, is finding itself in due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, any moment, uh, at any moment, things can change. And it's now an opportunity that we have is to plan and work under normal circumstances so that we are prepared against all, all eventualities. Um, our uh, projections uh, here at the Commission point to an explosion in demand for mobility that would follow uh, the pandemic. We will go through a tsunami of mobility at all levels, from tourism, travel, Erasmus exchanges, uh, academic exchanges, uh, uh, and migration, of course, is, is part of that. So we have, an, we have an obligation, we have an obligation, a responsibility, and an opportunity to, to uh, seize the moment and prepare uh, against all possible uh, scenarios, future scenarios. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a question from Aoife Hanrahan. Um, could you please explain to me why it seems that unaccompanied minors fall through the EU immigration policy and the conditions of member states reception centers for unaccompanied minors seem to have different conditions or indeed a lack of suitable conditions at all? Yes, this is true. Uh, this is true, and it's part of the regulatory fragmentation I was referring to earlier. As a general rule, um, uh, unaccompanied minors uh, cannot be detained, but you would agree with me that unaccompanied minors should be protected and should be put in a safe uh, environment and uh, protected environment. It is true that different member states uh, interpret differently uh, these provisions. So we have all different kinds of situations. I think that uh, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the member state I know best, uh, Greece, there has been a tremendous effort now on unaccompanied minors, not only to relocate them, basically there are no allocated, there are no unaccompanied minors anymore in the Greek islands. Most of them have been relocated. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, um, we have a system in place with uh, tutors that are in charge, the national organizations financed by the European Commission. I agree with you that the situation is not uniform. I agree with you that there is uh, room for improvement. Uh, and that too uh, goes through uh, the European agreement on the pact that we need, which will connect everything to everything. It's easier to, to work on these uh, sensitive areas uh, with the pact in the statute book than it is now. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, we have a question from Donald Cronin uh, of the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, I suppose it's a perennial one in relation to European affairs, but it applies perhaps with particular force in, in this area. How best should we tackle misinformation with regard to, with regard to migration? Uh, it's not an easy one uh, because uh, migration, as I was saying earlier, is, 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 is directly linked to at the heart to the heart of polit of the political debate and political exchange um, we have been calling uh, both the commissioner in charge of home affairs and myself uh, for for two years now for a more uh, sober uh, approach to migration we we want migration to be a normal subject uh, as as environment if possible as agriculture but it is not the case because uh, there is a direct link with political uh, debate. Uh, there are, you know, political uh, parties, and political groupings that uh, are single issue parties uh, based on migration. So uh, the, the, the efforts to de-dramatize uh, migration uh, are not that, uh, that simple. So um, yes, we're facing with lots of um, uh, disinformation, lots of uh, conspirationism. Uh, in my previous life as uh, chief uh, spokesman for the commission, I have uh, seen my picture uh, uh, in billboards in different parts of uh, the European geography as uh, Soros's friends, as uh, the Greek who wants to Islamize his country and so on and so forth. Um, there is only one way to cope with this sort of uh, pathologies is uh, fight back, uh, answer back, um, debunk. Um, we are trying to do this in the commission. I think uh, uh, since we are a prime target uh, of these attacks, now we also have developed the capacity to, to respond uh, in a way, the era of innocence is over uh, for us too. But um, there is always a limitation when you are attacked by the extremists, by the populists, uh, to reply from, from Brussels. You know, there is always an asymmetry between uh, a vocal populist attack and the Brussels institutional response, uh, which can never be equal in intensity. But I will say this. The best way to uh, face to uh, the populist phenomena and win the battle is to have a European agreement on the EU migration and asylum pact. Because those who have attacked our pact are mainly the extremists and the populists in Europe, not mainstream parties. When the mainstream parties, we had an equal share of complaints and pain. For, for me, it's a good thing. <laughs> it shows that there is a way to compromise where everybody protests. That means that there is room uh, to get an agreement. But those who attacked violently the pact were the extremists and the populists. And we have two important fights against these forces in Europe. Next is the German uh, legislative election in September this year. And the other fight will be the French presidential election in May 22. There is no better way to silence the populists by being able to show that Europe can produce agreements on difficult issues like migration. And uh, this is a moment. Uh, we can do it, we can do it before, uh, the two elections. Ideally, we could do it in between. <laughs> but if we do it after, I think we won't service, uh, we won't make a service to our democracy. We will have the, the extremists more. Okay, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, we have a question from Sarah West, uh, uh, who thanks you for your informative presentation. Um, she wonders if you could speak more about the um, uh, uh, um, new pre-screening at borders where asylum claims would be initially assessed, which would take into account if there are low levels of successful asylum claims from their country of origin. Um, and she asks, how can this be reconciled with the obligation to assess individual asylum claims? 
Uh, I think that uh, what I'm going to say is something between the, the, the first and the second floor of, of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, when someone arrives at the external borders of the European Union, something needs to happen. <laughs> Uh, the same way as uh, when someone arrives at the external borders of the United States or, or Australia or, well, I think in Australia it's not easy to arrive at the external borders unless you're part of the, of the legal migration system. But as far as we are concerned, we want uh, to make a difference under the pact proposal that the, the, the entry into the European Union is not a, a, a trivial uh, affair. That means that whoever uh, arrives before filing for asylum would have to go through the so-called screening procedure that would determine um, uh, his uh, background, his, the origin, whether he comes from a country that has a low or high recognition, asylum recognition rate. We have to have him checked for health and security. Uh, this is obligatory. May I remind you that the, the butchers of Paris and Bataclan came through uh, the Greek islands and found uh, their way uh, in 2015 from uh, Syria to uh, central Paris in a week uh, without any uh, control, without any uh, filtering, without any screening. So we need this uh, screening procedure at the border. It is a procedure that would be fast and we will seamlessly connect to the next stage, which is the border procedure, which is the asylum procedure. But we need this first screening test. And of course, that would determine uh, this connectivity of the system that I was referring to. Uh, those who would not have grounds for asylum would have to go through a, a returns procedure. Those who are a security risk will not be able to uh, apply uh, for asylum. Those who have uh, health issues would need to be taken to special facilities. And may I say, so if I may say, this is not only something that you will see happening in the external borders of the Union in the Greek islands or in Canary Islands. This can very well happen in, in Dublin airport or, or in, in Amsterdam uh, airport, because these are all part of the Union's external borders. So we do need the screening procedure we will have full guarantee of respect of fundamental rights because we have provided for a, a, a reinforced role by the European Fundamental Rights Agency who will be present in, in, in helping member states uh, to handle these procedures according to our values and our principles. So um, yes, we need the screening procedure and I think it's, it's, it's good that it's part of our policy mix. Okay, uh, a, a, a question then that um, um, and perhaps uh, overlaps a little bit with that. We have a question from Ross Fitzpatrick, um, uh, who calls attention uh, to um, allegations that were made about Frontex that it was involved in um, illegal pushback of, uh, of uh, migrants, which led, uh, I think, the UN Refugee Agency to call on EU countries to investigate. And uh, he wants to know what steps are the Commission taking to ensure that Frontex uh, isn't uh, engaged in doing anything illegal in terms of, in terms of pushbacks. Yes, I, I, first of all, I fully agree that uh, all allegations uh, pertaining to these kind of incidents need to be investigated. And um, no, not only as, as a means to attribute uh, blame and demand responsibilities, but also as a major uh, element of legitimizing the increased role that we expect from Frontex in the years to come. So these allegations uh, have been uh, investigated uh, by uh, the uh, management board of Frontex, uh, and these are 13 allegations at all. They have been uh, investigated uh, thoroughly. And uh, 10 days ago, uh, the management board uh, ruled that there was no involvement of the agency in this type of incidents. I repeat that, uh, we are the European Union <laughs> and uh, everything we do on migration and asylum would have to be compatible with our values and our principles, cannot be at the expense of our values and principles. So everyone who aspires 
and is entitled to file for asylum should have the possibility to do so. But at the same time, the Frontex regulation clearly allows the agency to fight smugglers, to ask uh, uh, smugglers to deviate from their course. Frontex is under legal obligation to help us um, face uh, and respond to hybrid threats. May I remind you that a year ago in the Greek-Turkish land border in Evros, there was a, the weaponization, the instrumentalization of 20,000 uh, poor people who were put in buses and were brought from uh, Istanbul to the border <laughs> with a promise to, uh, uh, you know, you will be in Munich uh, tomorrow morning. Europe needs to be able to face, to defend the border, to defend our collective, uh, uh, our collective uh, management of the border uh, against all these threats without putting in doubt the right of individual uh, filing for asylum. I do not think that these things are antithetical. I, I, I think that they are perfectly, uh, it is perfectly doable to combine uh, border, effective border management control with the fullest respect of the uh, legal rights of an asylum seeker. Okay, um, a, a perhaps linked uh, question to that um, uh, comes from Adriana Parejo, um, who asks, uh, would it be possible um, for Vice President Skinas to elaborate on um, uh, the distinction between legal and illegal migration? And I think what she's particularly um, concerned with uh, um, uh, and, and more in, 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 in connection with the, with the new pact uh, is how asylum seekers can possibly reach EU borders regularly with, without resorting to smuggling, if, if you like. So thereby, if you like, becoming illegal migrants uh, so, uh, well, th th there is a, a terminology <laughs> issue in migration policy. I think uh, I, I do not want to, to discuss legal versus illegal uh, migrant. I think that the, the right term to use would be um, uh, legal migration is uh, a system that would bring uh, people within the European Union on the basis of a well-established legal procedure be it uh, through legal pathways or resettlement or uh, on a skills-based uh, scheme. We have some pilot projects that are working quite well, uh, I would say, in, in Northern Africa. So legal migration, I think, is clearly defined as, as, uh, as that. Now, uh, uh, asylum is, of course, a process where uh, individuals can apply for asylum, but clearly there are relevant factors in, in this process named that, that, that our member states are obliged to consider, uh, which other than security concerns, of course, is the, 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 the fact of the uh, high or low uh, recognition rate. This is an important element that uh, our member states can take into account. And Rather than illegal migration, I would say irregular migration. <laughs> irregular migration are uh, 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 people, individuals who do not flee uh, uh, persecution or dictatorship, uh, which is a direct link to the asylum laws and the Geneva Convention, but to flee from other conditions. And this is something that uh, clearly would have to be established. So, um, uh, fighting smugglers is about fighting smugglers. Addressing legal uh, uh, asylum claims is, is a different thing. I mean, uh, uh, one can always uh, be able to ap apply for asylum, to file for asylum, but uh, uh, smuggling operations are illegal. So we have to strike a right balance. And I think uh, uh, when we have orderly, uh, manageable man uh, migratory flows, this is, this is possible. When we have massive uh, migratory flows, this is practically impossible. I mean, can you imagine how we could process 25,000 people in Nevros uh, who were brought there <laughs> uh, in an afternoon and, uh, uh, and were sort of uh, throwing uh, stones and organizing unrest, this cannot be managed. So we're looking for a system where everything can be manageable. Asylum requests, returns and readmissions, 
solidarity for those who stay, speedy procedures, integration into our societies. And this is what you find in the pact. Okay, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for that, um, uh, Commissioner. There are in fact a range of, of further questions that I could put to you, but I see that we're actually coming up um, to two o'clock uh, at the, the moment Irish time. Uh, so uh, uh, having promised to keep the event to one hour only, I can only apologise to those of you. There are some excellent questions that uh, that remain to be asked, uh, but um, uh, unfortunately uh, perhaps that might be something we have to do in the framework of the suggested um, uh, examination of migration policy, uh, I think, and uh, hopefully uh, we might uh, be able to call on you again at some stage in the future to address. Um, you've done wonderfully in, in answering a range of, uh, of questions. As, as an academic, um, uh, I think I would feel quite challenged if I had a range of questions from such a, from a, a, a containing such a, a broad number of issues. Uh, so, so it's wonderful uh, that you, you, you came here and you were so uh, willing to deal with those uh, questions again. Great to have you back and we look forward to welcoming you not just digitally but perhaps um, actually in the flesh uh, in, in, the not, in the not too distant future, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the first things I will do after the pandemic is to visit Ireland. Uh, this is something that I, I have very much present in my mind and uh, be under no illusion that would entail also a visit to, to the Institute. Uh, hope to see you all there. <laughs> we, we will look forward to that very much. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you.